we've got this one is called the manual of hexterity by broadsword bard I saw this posted on i want to say on the osr subreddit didn't either uh, I, I think i might have seen it before we had the last week's weekly chat but i knew i'd want to cover this as, as part of the hex crawling so i didn't want to double dip and talk about it during the uh the roundup this is based on a hex crawling video that i haven't watched it's very popular it's frankly it's much more popular than any of my hex crawling videos which part of you makes me sad but i think it's also i think it i think if there's if, if i could point out one of my weaknesses i think i am not uh, programmatic enough for some folks in my approach that i'm not giving a more step one do this step two do this step three do this and I think that videos that follow more of that formula, like, no, I'm going to give you, not necessarily phrasing it as the one true way, but I'm going to basically present you a more or less dogmatic style approach. I think they tend to do better. Should I do that? I don't know. Let me let me know if you feel like I should write down, like, here's the hex press method. And that way people can go tear it apart on Twitter and watch and hate watch and all that. But anyway, there's one I think it's called How to Hex Crawl. Extremely popular. And from what I gathered in the contents when this was posted, that they basically took took the guidance and broadsword Bard's idea, I think, was that they use it for their own game and they wanted to kind of write up documentation. And why not write it up in a way that they can format and share and sort of save folks the work kind of thing. Don't you know, save folks from kind of reinventing the wheel. I believe it is pay what you want. There's a link to the drive through URL in the show notes. Intro. This document is designed to help you run a hex crawl for old school fantasy tabletop role playing games. There are many guides, blogs, videos, and forums full of advice on the subject. This guide is my personal distillation of all the research I did when I decided to take the plunge into running a hex crawl. Herein, you will find advice on how to keep a notebook, make a calendar, design and key your map, and populate it with interesting sites of adventures of adventure featuring encounters with monsters and NPCs. The system can be used or adapted to work with any old school RPG system based on the famous that famous RPG we all know, especially ones based on an edition of that game with both basic and expert versions. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And super especially one that is essentially old school. The following is a list of some of the main inspirations that helped me put together this book. And here we have some links. Gucci, Fuligan Cloaks, blog, GFC's Table Scraps, K-Tray's blog, D4 Caltrops, Arnold K's blog, Go Goblin Punch, the Beyond Formal Hout blog, and then Professor Dungeon Master's YouTube channel, Dungeon Craft. Hey, the Dave, good morning to you. Good afternoon for me, good morning to you. Oh, look at that. <laughs> dee, 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 dee. I think this is the first time I want to say, gosh, I wish they had told me that. I would have uh, would have <laughs> introduced more fanfare. So look at this. We, we've come full circle. I think this is the first time ever that I just picked something off the reference and found myself referenced <laughs> reference in the material. So I suppose you can blame me. If some if some some part of this guidance in this document herein leads you astray, I suppose I need to fault myself for that. But that's kind of cool. <laughs> this is big time. Big time. And then the OSR subreddit and then other folks and then their their gaming group. So that's awesome. Well, look at that. Look at that. I'm in, I'm in good company, I guess. All right. On to the first part. And the funny thing is when I saw this, I did, I did just take breeze through this recently, but in the, my very, be, very far behind, but I'm slowly getting, slowly catching up to things, uh, stuff that I'm working on for my, the Kickstarter zine. I actually have a calendar. Mine's not formatted like this, but it's kind of funny when I see the same ideas coming up. It's like, I have that kind of, I have a calendar like that. Anyhow. Chapter one, or I don't know, section one, running a hex crawl. I don't know if I'm going to read all of this. Well, let's see. I only have two things to do, and I've got an hour to do it. So maybe I can read through it all. We'll see. We'll see. At first, I thought I wouldn't have an, I would have too much time. Now I'm starting to rethink that. But let's, let's get into it. Running a hex crawl. The notebook. Get a three ring binder. You will fill this binder with your calendar, map, hex key, encounter tables, treasure tables, copies of the feature and monster tables in this document, any other tables and tools. You want and a lot of blank pages. Oh, and just in a note, I believe also from the subreddit they mentioned that I think their their concept with this, so they they may not have written it anywhere, is that you you would kind of print out these you would print out these pages, print out duplicates of anything you needed, and then have kind of one of those binders, much like you might have done in the past with your basic expert stuff, like I have here with ooh ah 
oops, this stuff falls out the bottom of it, uh, that you could then do that with this document. So when he's talking about creating a binder, I think he means that uh, to literally, you know, print three hole punch, start throwing things in there. You can also use tabs, separators, and you should have a clear sleeve in which to place your map so you can draw on it during games with a wet erase marker. That's a nice piece of advice. Lots of things you can do with wet erase markers if you get things laminated and use covers and things like that. The map. Now it's time to make your hex map. You can do this by hand using an app or a little bit of both. You can use the free version of Hexographer. See links to do everything required here. All right, we're, not, we're gonna... I want to get to their guidance. So this is basically that setup. Here we go. Let's get to the calendar. So that's something more or less unique to this. There is some guidance. Just try to have at least some of the following terrain types. Grassland, forest, jungle, slash jungle, hills, mountains, swamp, rivers, slash lakes, and desert. Combine two types, mountains, grasslands, etc. They use the six mile hex and they have a blank hex map in here see the calendar the next thing you need is a calendar make a page or two with a space for each month where you can jot down holidays and upcoming events keep another page for the current month with each day listed and spaces for the weather moon phase and notes an example can be found on the following pages use a weather generation tool almanac hex flower also links that's clever since we'll be looking at a hex flower later to regenerate the weather for each day of the current month fill in the moon phases if this is too much use my calendar which they have so we'll have we have a blank calendar and we have their calendar Ryan Smith says, I've started using a physical binder and they love it. Helps me actually get in the groove as opposed to finding some files amidst other files. Yes. And I find that when I'm playing the game, even on Discord, instead of having to try to keep up multiple windows if I'm trying to find stuff, I have just my binder. I can just flip through it. I can access it and not lose track of stuff that's going on. But yeah, I like having physical pieces still. Random monster and treasure tables using the... RPG of your choice, point, print out or create the tables for your dungeon encounters, wilderness encounters. That's basically stuff we know. Populate the map. Decide where your home base settlement will be and place it on the map. Just write HB in pen on the hex. That hex you desire. This is where the PCs will start and hopefully end each adventure. They can rest and restock here and gather rumors and information. I'm just sorry I'm, I'm, if I'm going a little bit fast. I'm trying to scan because I want to get into the real stuff. So this is basically it's just your overview, your ge generic kind of running a hex crawl thing. I think there's going to be more... I guess opinionated procedures later on. So I want to try to get there, but we here we have some simple holidays. We get another table with, let's see, what's this? Moon, moon phases also with events. Here we go. Brian Smith says, I have not made my own calendar though. Just can't bring myself to spend time on that and think my players will care at all. I think what, so what, what got me started with the calendar and I, I like this is I, I like thinking about kind of holidays, not only holidays or things that are coming up, but also as my players have started investing, I, I wanted to kind of look at when, uh, well, one, keep the seasonality, right? They're starting in the spring. So when's it get in the summer? And I want to be able to chart that a bit. I want to be able to have different events, holidays to when they come back to town at different, at different times of the year or different months or different aspects of the months. Maybe they're preparing for, I say, a harvest festival or they're tearing down from a harvest festival, that kind of thing. I like the idea of basically that tax day, right, where, where your rents are due. And as my players have started investing in stuff, I want them to think about it. On this day, the collector, the sheriff or whomever's going to come around and you need to have your stuff, you know, paid, paid by that. And also, I like to try to use it a little bit to play around with the availability of hirelings. If you're in that kind of heavy time leaving up the harvest it may be harder to find people because everyone is being basically having to go to their family farms or whatever or or having to do their little plots that they owe the their landlords or whatnot to do that so i like those flavors and then i can also think about if you have cults in opera cults operating and doing whatever things maybe they want to tie that into moon phases or tie that into other holidays so you, you automatically can have some ticking clocks in mind for things but it is it is kind of a pain i usually just think of taking basically our calendar wiping away a lot of the holidays or just keeping the holidays kind of their their dates but then kind of change or make more generic the meaning so i like to take those sorts of uh the more kind of medieval and before holidays that follow basically your planting season and all that i like having kind of a christmas holiday i like that in the one ring having that yule season but it, it's not really a, a christian kind of christmas but it's that sort of end of year turning of the year, which helps with downtime. It's kind of an enforced downtime during the winter. Uh, I, I do like that stuff. All right, hex features. 
Map populations. After creating your map, roll 1d20 for each hex. When you roll a 1, roll on the following table to find what type of hex feature to use. After you have populated your map, divide it into sections of equal size and make sure you have a few interesting things in each section. If you don't, pick an interesting hex and populate it. All right, so they're, they're not giving us rolls for the type of hex, so it's leaving it to our imagination to actually draw our map, which if you have trouble with, right, we went over that Welsh Piper thing, which is probably the a good default if you're not going to use something like hexographer to randomly generate use some land or some other tool you've got one of those but once you have that and you're trying to then fill it in so here we only have a five percent chance they're saying of having something interesting because you have to roll that one on a d20 which is five percent and then the types of things we could get it's a d8 it could be a landmark it could be a magical site or it could be a structure a landmark is a place that PCs can easily identify and use to know where they are on the map. It might be occupied, but usually not. So this would be something that would be good for if we're talking about navigating in the wilderness, having things that a party can discover and then point to and say, we, we, know, we might not know how to get all the way to a certain place, but we know all the way in the wilderness, but we know that we have to go to this. If we go find this hanging rock. And then we go over here to the giant tree and then we go here like you can zigzag so that's all these kind of landmarks so the things that the pcs you can have them discover and then they can kind of lock in segments of their almost like making their own trail going from a hex crawl to a point crawl so we we know from the settlement we know how to get to hanging rock and that part becomes a point crawl and as they chain those points these landmarks together they can make their travels through the wilderness if not more safe necessarily than more uh, reliable, right? Then we have magical sites. No one knows why these sites exist, but they are known to grant travelers boons, though a few are cursed. At minor magical sites, the PCs must rest to gain a boon, while at major sites, one PC must take a particular action. A phantom of the past will mime the action required before disappearing. Example, when you arrive at the site, you see an altar rising from the ground. A phantom knight appears and places his sword atop the altar. These phantoms are context clues for the PCs to use in deciding who uses the site and how. Cursed sites are disguised as major sites of features or major sites and act exactly like them until the PCs receive a curse instead of a boon. So I like the idea of these kind of magical sites. I don't know that I'd always want to have a phantom. I think you could probably do more with that if you wanted to and working it into your campaign, working it into the, the settlements that are nearby, doing things like if you have holidays or customs in a local village and they go out to this altar you can think about, well, did they, were they in town for the celebration that maybe had someone do something at an altar? And then they might take that. But if they make the connection that here's this old ancient altar, if I do that same thing, maybe something will happen. And it probably would be thematically linked to whatever they were doing in the village, stuff like that. But if you just need something kind of randomly, then the phantom thing is kind of interesting, especially if it's doing something that the PCs can't just easily do. Because you think a phantom knight takes a sword, puts it on the altar. Great. Every party's still going to have someone with a sword, I presume, pretty much, to put the sword on. But what if it was the Phantom putting, like, a, a, a dragon egg on the altar? Then that becomes basically a whole adventure prompt. Because now it's like, I want whatever boon that is, it's probably pretty good because it takes this egg. I mean, in A, you may need to figure out the dragon egg. Maybe all you see is a Phantom placing a, a large egg. You have to determine what that egg is. And then once you determine it, then you have to go find it. So that could set up a whole pattern of adventure. You could also tie in these major these major sites with moon cycles. Maybe you only see this on a new moon or on a full moon or on some other phase of the moon that fits in with whatever's going on again with the culture and with the theme of whatever is happening. Brian Smith likes this. Kind of like a shrine idea. Not too keen on the always having a guide spirit, though. Also says, deciphering what the action is by observing a spirit guide doing it could allow some characters to figure out a puzzle or clue with insight rather than investigation or something. I think... Yeah, I think it's nice. I think it's know your know your uh, know your group, know what they're into. I think in terms of or in this setup, we're, we're, we we may we may be doing this kind of on the fly. So it's nice to kind of have this idea and say we can have this thing that spirit mimicking is good. If you want to make it more evolved, you can you can do that, right? Structures are houses, towns, crypts, dungeons, churches, and more. These are your main sites of adventure where the PCs will encounter. Enemies and NPCs and explore to find treasure. When populating your map, make sure you have at least one structure in each section. In your base settlement, the PCs should be able to hear rumors about these sites. And then we have a note about between adventures. Note which hex features the PCs have fully explored or likely won't return to and place a small mark on the map by each. Make sure each of your sections still has 
interesting features, at least one structure, not counting the ones you have marked explore, repopulate if necessary. And now we get a table for landmarks. We need some inspiration. It's a D8. Oh, this is the one I see. That's this guy. This is kind of clever. So the hex features, you rolled on that. It was a D8. And then it was one of four's landmarks. So here it's reminding you basically D8, one to four. Though I think I, I think I would like if it put hex features D8, one to four, because otherwise I was confused thinking that this is what I was rolling now. But what they're doing is they're calling back to just remember this is what you rolled. And you can kind of use it as a shortcut for checking out that table. And we get, I'm not going to read all these, but we have a D20's worth of landmarks, string trees or rock formations, flowers or vegetation, caves or overhangs, ponds or quicksand, springs or waterfalls, dell or crater, cliff or ravine, so on and so forth. Oh, I see, actually, yeah, we have a D20 of, of features and then also some trait about it. Could have a bun, abundant wildlife, could be burnt or charred, could be vandalized. Could have a trash of treasure, tra trash of treasure, a cache of treasure, or could give you a sinister feeling or bad vibes, something similar. And then we have another a D10 roll to check whether it is inhabited. 60% chance it's not inhabited. Looks like a 20% chance that it's inhabited by a small group, and then a 10% chance it's inhabited by a large group. I don't know what in encounter NA, I'm not sure what encounter NA means. And then we get a D8 of the kind of animals. Animal or vermin. Some of them have kind of subtables. It's an interesting way of laying out the subtables. So if you get roll a one, you get animal slash vermin. Then you roll an additional D6. And it's one to four. You get an animal. If it's five to six, you get a vermin. And then there's other types you can get there as well. We also get our magical sites table. D20 worth of minor magical sites, a D20 worth of major magical sites, and a D20 worth of cursed sites. Just a few examples of minor sites. Healing is doubled, re removes curses, removes diseases. You pass your next failed poison slash death save. Boy, that's handy. Major one might give you a wish, might give you a plus one to all saves, might give you 1D3 permanent HP, might get a new random spell. A cursed. Someone forgets you exist. <laughs> I would I would think someone important. Maybe just not some some random person in the world. You're aged 10 to 20 years. You can't lie. Your weapon becomes cursed. If it's a minor site, all PCs gain the benefits after resting overnight. Then the site becomes inactive for 3d10 days. A major site has that phantom miming and only one PC can gain the benefit. Then the site disappears forever. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So the whole Maybe the whole place is kind of phantom. So once you hit that ancient altar, I don't know if I like the idea that it disappeared, the site disappears forever, but maybe the maybe the benefit, you can only do it once or maybe in one generation or something. I, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd like to think about that one a bit more because I like the idea of having some powerful ancient place, let's say a Stonehenge type thing. And I like the idea of maybe you coming on it at a certain special time of year and seeing some procession that if you are able to follow it and mimic it and say the right things, do the right things, you get some kind of boon out of it. And I appreciate that you, they don't want you spamming that. But then I don't want Stonehenge to disappear. Maybe it changes. Maybe you have to wait. You have to figure out how to make it happen again. Maybe there's some process of this until some requirement can be fulfilled. We can't do it again. Or maybe it's going to change. We got to think about, well... What kind of new thing could it be? I don't know. I, I feel like I, I feel like I want more. I don't want I don't want them to just vanish. And then the curse is basically acts as a major site, except the reward is a curse. And now we have structures and settlements. Manor, a settlement, a stronghold, a temple, a tomb, a dungeon. Could be a house, village, you know, we understand. Conditions could be ruined, could be covered. So here we have this kind of table, subtable. So we have a Covered, and then it could be could be covered with sand, ashes, dirt, rock, mold, slime, webs, plants. Could be contaminated by something. Could be inside a crater. Could be sunken, burnt, crumbled, etc., etc. Could have some kind of magic, some kind of magical force acting on it. Could block arcane magic. Could block divine magic. Could have tons of illusions running around. Could be lawful. Could be chaotic could be neutral. And then it might be, and then how ruined is it? Answering the question of 
How ruined is it? Slight, moderate, and extreme. And then again, we have inhabited. Is it inhabited? Yes or no? Now we have a dungeons with a dungeon table. Get to roll for a purpose. Could just be a death trap. Well, at least it's honest. Could be a gate, a lair, a maze, a mine, a prison, a stronghold, a temple, a tomb, or a vault. And then we get size and depth. Small, medium, and large. If it's a small, we roll to see whether it's a single floor, two floors, or three floors. Medium, four, five, or six floors. Large, seven, eight, or eight plus a d6 floors. Brian Smith says, this is only two American dollars. <laughs> They're snagging it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is. Yeah. If, if you can give the suggested price, please do. Please. This, someone went through a lot of work, you, you know, to put this together. Two bucks. Less less than uh, less than what you'd pay for a Starbucks if you Starbuck whatever your coffee is on your way to the office. And we're all a lot of us are working at home now, so you don't even even get in that coffee. Throw throw the throw the throw the throw the guy or gal or the author a couple of bucks. But yes, it it is suggested. It is, I believe it is technically pay what you want. But if you can if you can spare it, if you can spare it, throw them, throw them, throw them a couple of bits. It is American dollars. If that makes a difference. To fill, out, uh, to fill out your dungeon, I highly recommend following the advice found on the Goblin Punch blog entry, The Dungeon Checklist. In short, every dungeon should include at least most of the things, the following features. Something to take, grunts to kill, something deadly, multiple paths, something that talks, something to experiment with, and a secret. That's a good checklist. I wonder if that, that's something, I almost, I almost wish they would put this as a checklist. Because like, that was something I liked in that uh, Gygax 75 challenge document was the concept of setting up these checklists so you could kind of go through and check those off and i think those are good and i, I would agree that probably having the majority of those one two three four five six so there's seven maybe having four of the seven i think makes a lot of sense all right smith says that for sure they could sell it for five bucks no problem i feel like the suggester pay what you want usually undervalues the creator yeah i i agree i mean there's probably a whole conversation we can have i think i think that uh we're in we're still in that I don't know, app store stage of things or early app store stage where there's a pressure to, to price down. And, and so you have people selling just crazy amounts of material for really cheap. And then when someone wants to value their efforts in, in a way that actually makes sense fiscally, it seems like they're really expensive because someone's giving you, here's a 200 page book with illustrated all on, I'm selling it for two ninety nine, And you're thinking like, oh my gosh, well then how can I sell my really excellent, but not 200 page it's only 10 pages it's got no illustrations or whatever thing for five bucks it just it just ends up spiraling down and yeah the people who get hurt are are the creators i don't know if we found our way out of that yet like we have with other things because i still see people will argue online but it's a pdf and you don't have to let to do anything so why should i pay you know kind of thing where it's like hello people had to, you want to pay people to be able to do this to be able to illustrate to be able to write to be able to edit lay out all that stuff you know, it, it all that work, uh, you know, value the work. Don't worry about it being a PDF or whatever format you're getting it, you know. So it's 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 tough. It's tough. And I, I, I think a lot of people struggle with it, probably. And then they just kind of shrug. And that's why, I th actually, I think that's another reason why I see a lot of proliferation of small things for like a buck. You're going to get a one pager for a buck. And then that kind of feels right. But but you, but there's a, this kind of gray area, or not a gray area, but there's this kind of thing between like that. Yeah, it's a pay what you want, a buck for a, a page or two pages, and then there's hey, I'm I'm releasing, you know, I'm trying to uh, where where does something like this compete between those things? Well, sure, this is clearly more effort and more everything than a one pager, but it's not somebody's, you know, heart heartbreaker that's you know 200 pages with full color glossy photos and all this stuff that's they've decided to try to juice up their sales numbers or get to platinum or whatever and now they're pricing it at you know five dollars <laughs> ours says hey dude why can't i have everything for free yeah exactly exactly and the thing is there is so much out there for free right so you know you get all this stuff for free you should hopefully you should enable people to spend a little money especially on the smaller publishers and creators who put a lot of effort in and don't ask much in return anyhow we're on to wilderness exploration. 
All right, so here we're getting some more kind of opinionated stuff, which is we're at the 30 minute mark. So hopefully it was we'll still be on track to get to the goblin goblins henchman stuff. All right, the PCs have three movement points per day, cost one to move to a hex of light terrain, two points for rough terrain, and three for very rough terrain. Bad weather can penalize their total by one per day, or terrible weather can make movement all but impossible. If the PCs have movement points left over at the end of the day but cannot afford to make a new move, they gain one movement point the following day. So basically, if you were sitting there and you had, because of weather and everything, you only had two movement points, and it's going to take you three to move out, you can't move. And remember, we're talking at a hex level, so it's not... If we were going to translate this to what we're telling our players in the fiction, it is not that they're not moving. <laughs> the idea is not that we didn't have enough movement points to leave the hex. So when I'm describing that to you as the party, I talk about you basically on a conveyor belt. For some reason, the trees aren't moving. Even though you're moving, you're walking, nothing is moving. No, you're moving, inching towards that border between the hexes, but you're not crossing over. You're staying in the same hex. But remember, that hex represents 30 some odd square miles if it's a six mile hex. Of territory, you're just not crossing over. You're getting closer. You're getting maybe those borderlands a little bit. You can describe it, but you're not crossing over. In terms of us, the GM sign on the back end, you're not moving over the hex. And if you are doing a player-facing map, then you're you're just you know you're telling them your progress is slow, so you're still in that hex. You're just you're not making as much as much as a, a forward momentum as you want because the weather, because of difficult terrain, blah, 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 right? But it, but if they do end up in that kind of spot, they will get a little extra nudge at the other side. And I, I, I've I seen this a couple of places. I don't know if they is if, if there was some kind of earlier iteration of this that I saw. It's an interesting system. I don't I don't dislike it. It is definitely a way of abstracting, moving into a, in, into a very easy for everyone to digest. Very simple. You get three points. This is how much of it's easy, whatever. And then you could just kind of figure it out and you don't have to calculate. You're not trying to calculate, oh, my movement. I, we move eight miles an hour. So this, it's pretty simple. And because everything's abstract anyway, and we're not, no one's got the means to accurately, to any finite degree, really, talk, really know how far they're moving and how fast they're moving, basically. Using this kind of abstraction, I think, can work. Fine. And if you find that easier to, to mess around with than trying to figure out the miles, miles to hex conversions and all that, then you can just kind of make up a thing of if I'm using six mile hexes and I figure they can work 13, you know, it's work, walk 18 planes, hexes, planes, miles in a day. That's three planes, hexes. That means one point for planes. And then I can just adjust up or down. If it's if it's rougher terrain, then now it's two hexes. If it, that would might include forests and hills. And then if they go into mountains and swamps, then it's three, three points. And then they're only going to move one in a day, which totally, I think he is totally workable. Ryan Smith says they like it. They hate calculating the movement rate. Yep. I, I am. I'm all for simplified moving rates because no one's got GPSs and, and speedometers on the ground. Nobody knows. Roads aren't even straight anyway. They're winding around. And sometimes you have to take longer to get around this or get around that. You got to ford little rivers and things that you might not mention in your narration, but they're there. You know, the tracks get worse if you got wagons and things. You got people moving slowly, blah, blah, blah. There's tons of reasons why you may not move as quickly as you think you're moving. And certainly you don't know how far you're moving. So just whatever you come up with, just be consistent. Because once your party starts to move back and forth, they're going to they're gonna figure out it's two days to this town because we've done it five times. It shouldn't suddenly turn into five days. Unless the weather's bad and some horrible things have happened. This says, uh, unless I'm playing with a group of land surveyors, I don't think of my guys have a sharp sense of miles across terrain. Anyway, they don't. And at least if you're playing like me and your hexes are invisible to the players, they don't even know whether they are in the same hex or different hexes anyway. Because I'm going to narrate their progress. It's just that their progress is slow, which I will also narrate to them and say, because of the bad weather, limited visibility, the road's gone all muddy and mucky or whatever, it, it's slowing you down. And that, that to me is about as much as they need to know. But Dave said that they put trade ones up for 15 for the PDF and drive through gets about a third of that. They worked on that almost every day for a year and I've only sold a bit over 100 copies. It isn't something you make a fortune on for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the Dave, I, I feel for you. And trade wins, folks, excellent. I did a, I did a, that. If you check out the low fantasy gaming uh, stream I did, I, I looked at that excellent product. And yeah, it's the 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 small creator stuff is is, is tough. It's... It's tough. So if, when you see those, pay what you want. Consider paying something. They'll say at the start of the day, describe the surroundings of the PC's current location, then ask what they wish to do. They can move to another hex, explore a feature on their current hex, or search for a hidden feature on their hex. 
moving unless the terrain or weather blocks their view. The PC should be able to see about one hex in each direction. Ask them to choose a direction, then check to see if they get lost using the table on the hex key page, which is over on this other page. Spend their movement points and move them into the next hex in the proper direction. Mark their movement on the slip cover holding your map with a wet erase marker. If the PCs did get lost, instead of moving them in the direction they chose, change their direction a number of edges in the indicated direction before moving. After moving, roll a random roll for a random encounter on the hex key page. Then they can also search, which is they can use their movement points to search a hex instead of moving. They roll x d y where x is the amount of movement points spent and y is the type of terrain so if it's a light terrain it's d6 rough d8 very rough d10 if a one is rolled a feature roll a feature to add to the hex describe it and let the pcs interact with it so that's cool this is kind of a neat little system basically the the their movement points they can spend are player facing so you might they might be in a planes hex and they go we're going to, we, we see that we're moving and we're going to keep, continue to the planes and whatever these specific planes are, say Savannah, but we want to, we want to maybe try to find something we thought was here, or we want to see if there's anything here. So we know that it's only going to take us one movement point, basically. We know how much effort it's going to take us to move towards our destination further, deeper into the planes. So then we're going to move, use two, the, the, uh, the two remainder of our movement points to search instead and spend it's almost like you're breaking up the day i know that i can get to this other i know i can move six miles in a couple of hours so i'm essentially look at those movement points which might maybe if we wanted to put in more of a fiction forward way we could say that you essentially have three movement phases during the day say your morning noontime and afternoon and how are you spending those segments so we're saying morning and noon time we're going to search so then then you would roll two and because it's a, a planes hex, it's a D6. So you roll two D6. If you get a one on either one of those, then you found something. And then you're using your afternoon. And now we're going to make forward progress. All right, Smith says, so multiple ones rolled is multiple features discovered. I suppose you could do it that way. Or it could be like rolling with advantage. You just get a better chance of rolling a one. That's probably how I would do it to begin with. But I suppose it might depend on how many features I can, I'm having in the hex. I suppose the way it is written in the book, it seems like if they roll a one, you roll a feature. So yeah, I guess it would be that yes, if there are multiple ones then you've got multiple features. And maybe that's when you want to break out your sub hex map and drop them somewhere if you want to be spatially if you want to make sure your spatial spatial distances between those two features are noted. Encounters once per day when the when the PCs make their first move or search, the chance is determined by what type of terrain they're moving into or if searching the hex they occupy. If there's an encounter, roll on the hex key page to find out what the encounter will happen. Counters happen as the PCs spend their first movement point. Noon is for the second, evening for the third. If a night, if night is rolled, the PCs have an encounter while they are resting for the night, disrupting spellcasters attempts to memorize spells for the next day. After determining if there is an encounter and when it happens, roll on the wilderness encounter table the correct terrain type using your preferred role playing game. If your game includes a percent in layer staff or monsters, roll to see if the PCs have discovered layer instead. And we also have exploring and then continuing. So let me get into this hex key. The turn, you describe your surroundings, the players move or search. There we have just this is just the basically the uh, summary of what we just read. We check to see if they get lost. This they're using a d12 roll. They're using edges. And I would just say with this stuff, just remember, follow common sense. Uh, someone actually commented on one of the other, I think it might have been my letting getting the hex crawling class on getting lost about the kind of moment to moment procedure. And I, I created a quick example. I, put, I responded to his comment. I also put it on the forums, forums.hex.press. If you go to the forums, I also linked a picture to the expert set on getting, getting lost, which actually has a pretty good little example. The one thing that their example doesn't do is cover their procedure for picking the directions. But it seemed pretty clear from the example that they weren't giving you 360 degrees of getting lost. It seemed to be at least implying that, hey, you kind of know where north is. You may not know exactly where it is, but you, you sort of know from landmarks behind you, from where you're traveling, which way north is at least to start. So in that, whenever you're rolling to get lost, it's basically you have a cone of the three faces. The, you know, if, if the face, the face of the hex that you are facing, the direction you think you're going being one face, and then having the two faces, angled faces to it, so that the, if you were going north and you got lost, you would be either going northwest or northeast. And then you could keep rolling. You would, you could end up turning around, but you wouldn't flip in one roll and suddenly be facing the other way. 
but there's probably some context there because I can see in a very amazing environment, mist shrouded, thick forest, you could end up turning around. You're not turning, going right back on the path you were on, but you just kind of in within those 30 miles of heavy mist shrouded woods, you kind of ended up making a big U-turn. So context kind of matters. Unfortunately, in the, in the expert set, at least I saw, they didn't say, well, how did we determine whether they were going northeast or northwest and why they didn't just go east or west or some other direction. That was kind of the sense I got. Martin Smith says they like the system, surprisingly well designed. And then Brian Smith also says that makes sense about the number of features because it would correspond to the amount of movement points or dedicated time to searching. Yep, it does make sense. All right, we got some more stuff here. Let's see, terrain. So it's basically, these are just, it's, it's, this is basically giving us the uh, turn. It's just a summary of the stuff over here. I'm not sure why they didn't, I don't know why there's nothing on this side of the page or was there supposed to be. Then we get some monster tables. I'm going to cruise through these. Just know that they are here and you got plenty of monsters to choose from. If you want to roll for random monsters and you don't want to switch to a different book, including you can roll up a random adventuring party or some monsters, humanoids and funguses and oozes. We also get some encounter activities. Like when you encounter some creatures, what are they doing? They could be celebrating a victory. They could be defeated. They could be a mourning. They could be escorting treasure, eating and resting, training, building something, looking for a new home, seeking lost comrades, yada, yada, yada. We got uh, a whole bunch of there. Basically, what, 60, 60 different ones. First, you're going to roll a D6 and then pick one of those columns and then roll your D20. Alignments for a bunch of creatures. We get, we get some... Uh, a blank hex map, and then we get some uh, links to stuff, hexographer, hex flower, weather generator, the donjon dungeon generator, one page dungeons, and the five room dungeon. So all good stuff, a little compact. What does this end up being? How many pages? I'm on page 21. So really nice, really nice work by Broadsword Bard. It's called the Manual of Hexterity. They posted that on, on Reddit, and uh, yeah. Good stuff.